Happy Easter, my friends. It's already been a great worship service so far. Let's give it up for the band and the choir. Thank you. You can flip in your Bibles to uh, Colossians chapter 1. My name is Jordan Massey. I'm one of the evangelists here. And happy Easter. It's great to be together to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, For us here at North River, we've been going through a series on the Sermon on the Mount for the last three months. So for the first time in three months, we're not talking about the Sermon on the Mount, all right? And we're taking a detour to focus on the central theme that all other themes in the New Testament are based off of. The title for today's message is Jesus, period. And if uh, I got it right here, whoops. Jesus, period. Okay. (laughs) Jesus, period. There you go. So just in case you don't know, that's not just a uh, a pronunciation uh, like at the end. It's a uh, a a word, all right? So it's Jesus, period, period, right? So here we go. We're talking about Jesus today. Um, You know, we've been looking at Jesus' teachings a lot as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. Today, we're talking about who Jesus is. Today, we're not going to talk much about his teachings, but we're more talking about who he is. And I want to start with this thought, that you are worth the blood of a God. You're worth the blood of the one true God. And yet, this draws the question of who is that God? Do we know who we're talking about when we say that God died for me and for you? You know, as we're talking about death here, and and we're celebrating not just death, but resurrection today, but when certain people on earth die, the whole world reacts. So with President Kennedy, or with Michael Jackson, or Kobe Bryant, or Queen Elizabeth, when you first heard that, sometimes you'll never forget when you first heard that news. And however you react to someone's death shows what they meant to you. So last uh, fall, Queen Elizabeth died, and uh, Toya loves the royal family. And so she was devastated. I mean, I still think she's in her feels about it. But I don't, I mean, I I care that someone died, but I don't really care much about the royal family. I just texted her like, hey, you saw she did? (laughs) Like, it didn't didn't mean anything to me. (laughs) But the truth is, I think sometimes when we talk about Jesus died for you, we can answer the same nonchalant. Oh, I've heard that. Oh, I've been there. I, I, you know, I, I could tell you a story if you want. And it just goes in one in your ear and out the other. So today, we're not just letting a belief in the death, burial, and resurrection just be an intellectual concept. We're taking a step back, and we're pausing, and we're saying, do you know who actually died for you and who rose from the grave? So we're going to start here in Colossians chapter 1, and uh, Paul, in a moment, is going to be talking about uh, how Jesus died for us. But the important thing about knowing who died for you is because when you don't have a proper perspective over who God is, you take God off the throne of your heart. And the throne of your heart is all about, man, who are you devoting your life to? What are you putting all your best efforts and money and energies into? For me... What I had to really wrestle with as I decided to follow Jesus was taking off the God of success off the throne of my heart. My whole life was bent on making money and becoming successful. God had different plans for me as a pastor. (laughs) The other thing was the God of relationships and taking that off. And the, I just wanted love. I wanted acceptance. My whole life was bent around girls or who liked me or who I fell in love with. I had to take that off. But the biggest one that was on my heart that I had to wrestle down was the God of self. And to take the God of self off so that the true God could come on. Who rivals God for the throne of your heart this morning? Who or what is it that you can devote your life to that your whole life is bent off of instead of God? Because today we're talking about the only true being that has a right and that, has, that can, deserves the throne of your heart. There's no one else besides God that deserves to sit there. Amen? So now we can go to Colossians 1. So in Colossians 1, Paul, in a moment, in a couple sentences, is going to get into how uh, Jesus died for us and why he died for us. But before he gets to that... He wants you to know who died. 
So he starts here, we're talking about Jesus. The Son is the image of the invisible God. That's just an epic line, isn't it? The firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Oh, I just love this. Paul's going, you've got to know who died for you. That everything in creation, in heaven, in the space, or on earth, was created for Jesus, through Jesus, and in Jesus. Jesus is the star breather. Jesus is the universe maker. Jesus is the earth founder. What a great God he is. Amen, church? And the two qualities I want us to focus on today is uh, his love and his power. We're going to be talking about how Jesus is love. Who is Jesus? Well, his, he's powerful, and his power is breathtaking. And who is Jesus? He's full of love. His love will take your breath away. So first, we're going to talk about his power. Now, I don't know if uh, you have noticed something that we have lost in our fast-paced society. As we're going from one thing to the next and moving through, we often have lost the perspective to stop and be in wonder over what's around us, to be in awe over what God has created. And I don't know if you've noticed who helps us most with this, our children. My boys helped me the most with this. So two weeks ago, Toy went out of town for the weekend, and I had the boys for three days straight. You can give your reward later. They survived. Amen. But there was an afternoon where I had to figure out what am I going to do with these two, you know, massy minions, right? And we didn't go to the playground. We didn't go to like a trampoline park. I found the best thing for them to do for a really long time. We found a puddle. <laughs> and that's all they needed, right? That's my son Cam on the right, you know, one eye, one hook, just having the best time of his life. That's Caleb, my year and a half year old with his smirk, you know. He's saying to you guys this morning, if God's not on the throne of your heart, he's going to yak you up, all right? You see, he's, trying to, he's ready. But we, we found this puddle, and we just stayed there all day. And uh, at one point when we first got there, Caleb, he walked over to it, and he just, he just froze. <laughs> he's like, what is this majesty right here? <laughs> I mean, he even folded his hands. He was like, <laughs> and he was in wonder over a puddle of water. They teach me things about how to stop and not just go from one thing to the next, but to realize what has God created and what does that say about him? In Psalm 33, it says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. And we know from Colossians 1, that's talking about God and Jesus, the star breathers. So what I want to do for a second is I want to look at what God has created to show how powerful God the Creator is. Because one way you can figure out how powerful He is is to look at how powerful what He created was. Amen? So we're going to be talking about the stars here for a minute. We're going to talk about three different stars. I got some of these stats from Lily Giglio. But first, we're going to talk about our star, the sun. Life on planet Earth would not exist without it. It is our star. The sun is 93 million miles away. But it only takes eight minutes for light to go from the sun to this Earth and burn my skin. In the center of the sun, it is up to 28 million degrees Fahrenheit. So hot that a single grain of sand, if a single grain of sand was that hot, it would kill a person 75 miles away. So let's say, talking about the size of the, uh, the, the sun, let's say the earth was a golf ball. And all 7 billion of us live on this little golf ball. Can you see yourself? If the earth was a golf ball, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. That doesn't seem to mean anything to you guys, so here's a better representation, all right? That's how small the earth is compared to the sun. 960,000 Earths could fit inside the sun. And yet, of the millions and billions and trillions of stars out there, the sun is relatively small. So let's talk about two more stars. This 
is Beltagees or Beetlejuice. You can say either one, so I'm clearly going to call it Beetlejuice. I don't have to explain myself. <laughs> it, it is 427 light years away. It's twice the size, not of the sun, but twice the size of Earth's orbit around the sun. If Earth was a golf ball, Beetlejuice would be the height of six Empire State Buildings tall. Now, that doesn't seem to, you don't seem to realize that, how much, how big that is. So what I need you to do is buy plane tickets to New York, all right? Go to New York, go into Midtown, go to the Empire State Building, take your golf ball, put it on the ground. You'll look a little weird, but no one will notice it's New York. And then, and then go across the street and then, and then look up. And then imagine in your mind's eye six times the Empire State Building compared to the size of that little golf ball and try to find you on it. It is so huge. 262 trillion Earths would fit inside Beetlejuice. It's enough to fill up the Mercedes-Benz Stadium 3,000 times with golf balls. But let's talk about the largest star that humans have found in the known universe. It is this star called Canis Majoris. And it shines bright in the night sky. You know, I'm not an English major or a Latin major, but Canis Majoris just sounds like it should be the name of the largest star in the universe. We, we went and looked it up. Um, it actually means the greater dog. It is the big dog star. Like that's literally its name. If the earth was a golf ball, Canis Majoris would be the size of Mount Everest, six miles high. So what I need you to do is take plane tickets from New York over to Nepal with your little golf ball, go over there, climb up the mountain, unzip your parka for a second, and then put the golf ball down to see how big and how small the comparison is. Seven quadrillion Earths fit inside Canis Majoris. Now, I don't know if you know what that means. Like, I barely can understand what the trillions of dollars in our national debt means, much less what quadrillion is, right? So a, a billion is a thousand million, a trillion is a thousand billion, and a quadrillion is a thousand trillion. You guys following me? No? Okay, let's try a different way. All right. When I heard this, it blew my mind, okay? A million seconds ago, 12 days ago, a billion seconds ago, was January, 1981. <laughs> a trillion seconds ago, and you might go, I'm catching on. We're talking about the 1700s, aren't we? No, a trillion seconds ago is 29,700 BC. A quadrillion seconds ago was 30,800,000 years BC. And seven quadrillion Earths fit inside Canis Majoris. Even the Earth's orbit around the sun seems puny compared to this one ginormous star that God breathed out of his mouth. Seven quadrillion, uh, if it was seven quadrillion golf balls, is enough golf balls to cover the entire state of Georgia, Florida. North and South Carolina, and Tennessee, 22 inches deep in golf balls. That's how big this is compared to us. Now, when I talk about these things, a shrinking feeling comes over me. And it's not a bad shrinking feeling. It's a good shrinking feeling. Because there's this interesting thing about sin, where sin tends to make fake gods of this world bigger and make God smaller. And sin tends to puff me up and make me feel bigger and make God feel smaller. Yet when I look at all that the creator God has created, I suddenly have a healthy perspective that I'm not the big one. I'm the small one. And God, well, God is amazing and he's powerful and he's glorious and he's wonderful and he's awesome and he's the big one, not me. I actually am the small one. So what does all this have to do with Easter, you might ask? Well, actually nothing. I just thought it was really cool. 
No, 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 no. Going back to Colossians 1. Let me show you. So before Paul talked about how Jesus died for us, he started in verse 16. He said, you got to know who died. Because then that's what puts it in perspective. So for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth. He was the star breather. Now that you know who we're talking about, let me tell you what he did for you. And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. And the church can say, Amen. The most unbelievable truth we're talking about this morning isn't the size of the universe. The most unbelievable truth we're talking about this morning isn't that there's stars that are so big we can't even imagine. The most unbelievable truth that we're talking about this morning isn't even that there's a God that created that. The most unbelievable truth we're talking about this morning is this. The miracle of today is that even though we are just a vapor on this earth, even though we are so small compared to the size of the universe, and even though God in his power created all of that, he marked me and you with greatness. You have been marked with the blood of Christ. The cross is where the star breather became the sin bearer. The cross is where the universe maker became mankind's savior. Do you realize how much Jesus loves you this morning? Me and you had this issue called sin. We took off God off the throne of our hearts and we put in success or relationships or acceptance or people or homes or me. And I put it on. And God said, even though you abandoned me in your sin, God doesn't abandon us. He didn't give up on us, guys. Instead of giving up on us, Jesus gave up everything for us. He gave up his everlasting power just so that you could have the power to be in his presence. He sacrificed his life for your sin so that you could have a life without sin. He allowed himself to be separated from God so that he could be united with you. Do you realize how much the God of power loves you this morning? God is an amazing God, and his love is incredible. As we talk about Jesus, period, yes, his power is breathtaking. Amen, church? His love does take our breath away. Why go to any other places for love and power when he is just waiting for us? Yet, his death is what we mourned Friday night. And that was a powerful service, wasn't it? But today is not a memorial. Today is a celebration because we know that the grave did not hold Jesus down, but he walked out of that tomb and he lives today. This is at the very core of our Christian faith. You know, at North River, we go through so many different topics through the year, so many different kingdom principles and kingdom teachings from Jesus, yet this is our central and core theme. Everything else is based off of this thought of Christ crucified in Christ resurrected. So what I want to do for a second, because I relate to this to the apostles. After Jesus rose up from the grave, that's, this is all they talked about was Christ crucified and Christ resurrected. So if just for a moment, I want to do a survey to see why for the apostles was the resurrection all that mattered. So let's start here in Acts 2. And let's look, after Jesus rose from the dead and he showed himself to them, then on the first day, the first lesson that was ever preached about Jesus risen from the dead, what'd they say? Let's check it out. Acts 2, 23. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death, talking about Jesus, by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. 
freeing him from the agony of death. And check out this next phrase. I love this. Because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Let me tell you what every single other human that's ever lived on the face of the planet has ever been conquered by. Death. It is impossible to escape death. It is impossible to rise from that grave. Yet the God of possible makes the impossible happen. And he rose Jesus from the grave, and it was impossible for death to hold Jesus down. With God that was raising him up. And they didn't stop there in chapter 3. It says, you killed the author of life. Yikes, that's intense. But it's the reality of who he is. But God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this. You know, for the apostles, they had witnessed a lot of different things over the course of their lifetime. And yet the only thing that they consistently say that we've witnessed this is the resurrection. They said, nothing else I've ever seen matters compared to this one thing that I saw, a dead man alive. That's all that mattered to them. You know, in chapter 4, as they continued to preach about the resurrection, they got in some trouble about it. It says they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seized Peter and John, and they put them in jail until the next day. Now, in a moment, we're going to see what they say. It's going to be the next day, and they're in the court scene talking to people that arrested them. And I just want to put your, you to put yourself in, that, in, in their shoes, Okay. If you just got arrested for saying that Jesus rose from the dead, the next morning when you go in front of those people that arrested you because you were preaching Jesus rose from the dead, do you think you would change your message? Like, do you think you'd go, let me, re- let me talk about a different point about Jesus' life besides the resurrection today. Let's see what they did. In the court scene, he, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, know this, you and all people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God has raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. I love this. They knew they were in shackles because they were preaching the resurrection, but they said, I got nothing else for you. I'm sorry. If you're wondering why I'm doing what I'm doing, I have nothing else to tell you. Because the only thing that matters to me is the resurrection of Jesus. It was all that mattered to them. So my question for us is the resurrection all that matters to you. You know, there's a lot of good motivations to follow God and be a Christian. But have you sacrificed the one true motivation for just good motivations? You know, the longer I get away from my baptism and the older I get as a Christian in my spiritual life, the harder this is for me. Because aren't there a lot of perks of being a Christian? Like, there's so much darkness and sin in this world that God has pulled me out of. And I can start to want to continue following him because of those reasons instead of because of that reason. What is your main motivation for being here this morning? Is it just because it's a ritual? Is it just because your parents did it? Is it just because somebody invited you? I really hope you walk out with, at the, at the very core of your heart, your heartstrings drum to the beat of Christ crucified and Christ resurrected. Amen? The resurrection is everything. So for once for all time, what does the death, burial, and the resurrection do for us? Here's what I want to say to close. What does it say? It says that God in his grandeur, spitting out stars that are bigger than we can imagine, didn't forget you. The star breather became the sin bearer. And he didn't forget you. So what is my call to you? Well, if that God didn't forget you, don't you dare forget him. Live in the power of the resurrection. Live in the, pa- live in the love of the resurrection where you can walk a new way of life now and forevermore, not because of your power, but because of his power. And you can go through this life, even as death approaches, knowing that, man, if God is strong enough to not let the grave hold Jesus down, then he's strong enough to not let the grave hold you down too. That Jesus is powerful and his love is true. This is the reality, guys. Does Easter celebration end for you after tonight? 
Or is the cross just something that you reflect on and celebrate just once a year or once even a week? Or is it through everything in all parts of your life is Christ crucified and Christ resurrected? Because Jesus, he invites us to live every day in the shadow of the cross, but also in the glory of his resurrection. We can live in that. I don't know what's been pulling you down recently. I don't know what has been like weighing you down and conquering you or the distractions that have been in your life. But I do know one thing for every single person in this room is that Christ is big enough to hold on to you. And Christ's love is bigger enough to pull you out of. But you have to decide that, you know what, that God that died for me, that God that breathed out stars and created the universe that was so powerful, that died for me, and now that he's risen from the dead, I'm not going to forget him the rest of my life. We sang a song on a Friday night, Sherwin or Chase, I forget the name, you can shout it out. But the last line, or one of the last lines was, never let me outlive my gratitude for you. And that's my prayer over us this morning. Let us never, let us never outlive our gratitude for this amazing God and what he did on Resurrection Sunday. You know, I'm so excited for us as a church to live in this power. I'm so excited for the resurrecting power to impact our church, to impact our communities, and to impact all across the city of Atlanta. And as we celebrate his power of, and, and him risen from the dead, we're going into communion, not as a memorial, but we're going into communion, not just remembering his death, we're going into communion celebrating his life. And so as you take communion here in a moment, I'm going to pray for us, celebrate how amazing God is, and how that great God died and rose for you and for me and for humankind. And renounce all those little fake gods that you've put on the, the throne of your hearts. Decide, I'm, not gonna, I'm going to forget about everything else because the resurrection is all that matters. Amen? Amen? Let's say a prayer together. Father God, as we take communion here, and we remember, we take the bread that represents the body of Christ, and we take the juice that represents the blood of Christ. God, we celebrate your power this morning. We celebrate your love this morning for how you, the great God of power and love, died for us and rose again just so we can have this opportunity to know you, God. And we come before you this morning to say we will not forget you. We come before you this morning, God, and we pray that we never outlive our gratitude and our love for you. God, we love you. Thank you for Jesus. We celebrate his resurrection this morning. In his name we pray. Amen.